It seems in a way that the world has used the, the ocean as a, as a garbage dump. You could throw stuff into the ocean and never see it again. I think people were naive in relation to the capacity of the ocean, just taking any amount of garbage and making it disappear. We're just collecting garbage along the shoreline here in Yakalui. So far, we found plastic bottles, cigarette butts, food wrappers, plastic bags, and a toy. We found a lot of plastic pieces and two straws. What's this? This looks like a wrapper, but it's uh, pretty strong. I think the world needs to know that we live off the land and the ocean is carrying all this plastic waste and this is affecting Inuit very much because we eat the animals in the ocean and we eat animals from the land. So to find plastic in their stomach is heartbreaking because these are our food. The world needs to pay more attention to plastic. So you can imagine that this particular bird, the northern fulmar, is a bird that was breeding in Arctic Canada or Greenland, the Baffin Bay region. But of course, this bird migrates thousands of kilometers down into the North Atlantic every year. This bird is flying out over the water, smelling out food, but it's also looking for things floating at the surface. In 2015, environmental engineers calculated that around 8 million metric tons of plastic entered the oceans each year. By 2025, if nothing changes, the amount will be closer to 10 times that, roughly 80 million metric tons. News images of large plastic garbage mounds floating in the base of urban centers are commonplace. But even in the remote waters of the Arctic and along the shores of communities that border these waters, plastic has become unavoidable. The region is really very far away, it's a small planet. And it's been considered that it's one of the most preserved in the first state of our planet in the first state. А вот Арктика сейчас потеряла свою привилегию, ничем не отличается в этом плане от других районов мирового океана. Plastic can take hundreds or thousands of years to decompose. This means that every piece of plastic ever manufactured still exists in some form. By the year 2050, it is estimated that the mass of plastics in the ocean will be greater than fish. It is clear that the, the plastic has, has invaded the Arctic. Solving the problem is not a straightforward issue. First of all, we need to get a better assessment of the problem. We know that we need to do something, and we're talking about different solutions. And the question is, how are we going to know that it works? Right now, we don't have the monitoring programs in place in order to be able to measure what is there now, and then be able to measure what is there later. We do not monitor just for, for the sake of it. We monitor to understand what's happening, to understand the levels, but also the sources. And only in that way we can establish the most cost-effective mitigation measures. Sources of plastic pollution in Arctic waters include the fishing industry's waste, industrial activity and shipping spills, and residential garbage from around the world. A piece of plastic dropped on a city street washes down into the sewer, out into a nearby river, and out into the ocean. As the plastic bobs along in the sub-Arctic waters, it joins with other plastic 
and, eventually, is carried north by currents that head towards the pole. This global conveyor belt brings some of the plastic from the southern parts of the world to the north. It was shocking for me to know how much plastic transit is happening already through the ocean currents to the Russian Arctic. We always think about Arctic as a clean place, but we are learning that actually there might be more plastic in the polar waters in some parts of the circumpolar basin than in some other parts of the ocean. The air currents come to the Arctic, the ocean currents come to the Arctic. Pollution in the south travels to the Arctic. We call it the Arctic sink. So even though it doesn't originate in the Arctic, it ends up here. Many communities in the Arctic depend on the land and the water around them for a lot of their day-to-day -day calories. It's a much more straight-line impact from the presence of um, any sort of contaminant, whether it's marine litter or something else, into their day-to-day -day consumption. Plastic is such an issue in the Arctic, among other things, because it also accumulates into the food that we eat, in particular fish and migratory birds. Exposed to the sun and salt water, plastic in the ocean deteriorates, loses its buoyancy and spreads throughout the water column. Larger, less dense pieces remain near the surface. Where we find plastic pollution floating along the surface is the buffet from which the northern fulmaros are feeding. They are picking the food 10 to 20 centimeters in, in the water column. And they are feeding on this probably because the plastic which is in the water are smelling of plankton. We know that they eat at the surface. We know that they eat things that are floating. And historically, this would have been zooplankton and fish. But now what we're finding and have been for the last 30 years is they're eating more and more plastic. Fulmars, along with other surface feeders like kittiwigs, encounter plastic throughout the Arctic. Northern fulmars, in particular, are well studied with an extensive range that covers this circumpolar region. These birds are long-lived and their populations are stable with accessible nesting colonies in most of the Arctic. Adults often feed up to 1,000 kilometers from shore, taking advantage of places where nutrients are concentrated by the ocean's currents. These same currents also carry the world's plastic. Sometimes you can actually feel the plastics inside the stomach. And I don't know if they're plastics, but there are certainly lots of hard bits. In this particular bird stomach, there are squid beaks. Squid is very common food for this species. But there is this plastic pellet here, which looks like an industrial nurdle. When people started researching plastic in the ocean, one of the first small pieces of plastic they found were these pellets. Some people call them nurdles. They are the pre-production pellets to a piece of plastic. Here in the Arctic, there's no plastic industry. Nobody's taking oil and producing it into pellets. But the presence of them up here says to me that those plastics are coming in from somewhere else. Oh, and as we, as we pull this out, we can actually see that we also have a fiber. It looks like a plastic fiber. Just within this one fulmar, we have both user plastic and industrial plastic. I think one of the most surprising things from our, our data sets is that we've never looked inside a group of northern fulmars from any location and found no plastics. That is really shocking when we think about how remote and far these birds are from major pollution sources. Methods for efficiently collecting and analyzing the effects of plastic on northern fulmars have been used in the North Sea over the past 30 years. A 2020 report from the Arctic Council advises adapting existing fulmar monitoring protocols for use in the Arctic and creating new ones for other indicator species like kittiwakes, murres, gilmots, fish and seals to increase plastic monitoring coverage across the Arctic. 
Doing this will allow the international scientific community to immediately begin to understand the scale of the plastic problem. This kind of monitoring does not require expensive research expeditions, but involves scientists working with local harvesters and community members. Преимущество такого вот орнитологического мониторинга пластикового загрязнения заключается в том, что птицы могут охватывать значительные акватории по площади, обширные акватории. When you find a seabird washed up on shore, that animal is reflecting the plastic concentration in a broader area, rather than just counting what's right there on that beach. Every bird from every location brings a little piece of knowledge, and we start to accumulate this over time and actually get a much more complete picture of plastic pollution in the north. What we find with the northern fulmar is that it's a very efficient and economical tool. By working together to implement pan-Arctic monitoring using seabirds, we can start tracking trends and sources of plastic pollution in the Arctic, right now. Only by working together can we tackle the problem of plastic and ensure that the people and the animals of the Arctic have healthy ecosystems for generations to come. На сегодняшний момент эти данные они довольно фрагментированный характер носят. А именно поэтому необходимо консолидировать усилия и обратиться к общим методикам. Необходимо иметь взвешенную и согласованную позицию всех арктических стран. Plastics do not respect country boundaries. It is a ubiquitous global problem, and we need a global solution. This is so important that we have the collaboration so you can show also the difference between the West and the East, the North and the South. We need groups around the world quantifying in a systematic way, continuously monitoring that year after year so that once we've started to reduce emissions, we can say exactly how much we've measurably reduced it in the environment. It's not only about monitoring plastic in the Arctic, it's actually about changing the policy in the Arctic and hence also affect policy in the world. Plastic pollution, unlike some of our other environmental problems, is not necessarily easily fixed, but there are solutions. In order to understand if the policies and solutions actually are, are working at the goal of minimizing plastic loss to the environment, we need to monitor along the way. 